Um, Polar, so this is about a talk with a fair amount of experiment in it, and it's in this biological physics uh, series because I wonder if there might be something that you could say about this in a truly biological context. So this is based on a paper that you can read uh, on the archive. Uh, experiments uh, in Ajay Sood's group, uh, with his student Roshan, uh, and theory and simulations by my student Rahul and uh, Harsh Soni, who is currently a postdoc with us. So I'll introduce it, I'll tell you about the phenomenon, and I'll uh, some theory, some experiments, and some simulations, and I'll summarize. Okay, so you know, clearly I'm interested in active matter at all kinds of scales, but the particular kind of active matter that's the subject of today's talk is artificial realizations of active matter, like this flock uh, of uh, pointy rods that organize themselves into an ordered state. I will not be talking about a flock, I'll be talking about uh, a rather different system. I'll be talking about a system uh, in which uh, one particular feature this should be quite generic in uh, active systems that uh, shows up in a rather pretty way, which is non-reciprocal interactions. Imagine you had two spins in a magnet and imagine that the exchange coupling that spin A felt due to spin B was different from the exchange coupling that spin B felt due to spin A. That clearly can't happen if the interaction comes from an energy function, but you can imagine that in a generic auto-equilibrium system it could happen. We actually started worrying about this kind of thing uh, nearly two decades ago, and we're continuing to worry about it, and so are other people. Uh, this will emerge towards the end of the discussion, I'll tell you how. Okay? The motivation, however, wasn't to study non-reciprocal behavior. It is that, you know, you look, people have looked a great deal at the interaction of swimmers in a fluid. Um, motile objects in an elastic medium and how they influence each other has not been studied uh, as much. People have studied uh, actively contractile uh, force dipoles in an elastic medium. People have studied motile objects moving through an elastic medium. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying people, the names are up here. Uh, in this class, in the, in the uh, Safran group work, the motile character was ignored. In Zilke Henkes and others' work, the orientation variable was indeed a polar orientation and motility, but the particles didn't talk to each other through the medium. So the question is, what happens when you've got motile objects moving through an elastic medium? Particles force the medium, the medium reorients the particle, and it turns out the dynamics is in a natural way, non reciprocal So we'll tell you about that. So now, um, if you go back to this story of a collection of polar rods moving through a medium of beads, which are dense but fluid-like, and they align each other by the movements that the rods create in the fluid. Uh, that's what this picture is trying to illustrate. Here is, this is, I think from a simulation, this is a polar rod moving through uh, a, a sea of beads. And we've tried to show here that if you color a few of the beads, as the polar rod moves, it drags the beads. If you increase the area fraction of the bead medium from 70% to 80%, then the polar rod goes through, but it really doesn't drag the beads with it. So now you've got a bunch of polar rods moving through a medium of beads, and they're not causing the bead medium to flow. Do they talk to each other? I just to highlight this here. In the fluid medium case, the, there's a flow field. In the crystalline medium case, there's basically some minor noise, but no flow. So how do polar guys moving through a crystalline medium talk to each other? Okay. So, I mean, for example, if you look at this guy, you can see it moving, and you can see that this medium here is crystalline, and as it moves, it's creating some kinds of disturbance in the medium. It's not exactly clear what happens. You almost get the impression that it sort of moves, disturbs the medium, the disturbance is gone, and nothing happens. You can theorize first about what might happen. You can say that I've got one polar particle, okay? Position R, orientation given by the unit vector N. You've got a bead medium in a crystalline state. Because it's in a crystalline state, I can declare that deviations about the crystalline state are described by a displacement field U. And if I pretend that that vibrated crystalline medium isn't very different from an equilibrium crystal if you want for this polar rod moving through it, so I'll say maybe it's governed by elastic free energy F. Okay, so then the dynamics of this bead medium, if I ignore inertia everywhere, is 
that uh, the friction on the beads due to the substrate on which they are sitting, which is some coefficient zeta, uh, balances the elastic restoring forces on the medium. If it weren't for this polar particle moving through it, that's all there would be. But because there is a polar particle moving through it, on any number of different grounds, you can argue that you are allowed to introduce a forcing on the bead medium in the direction of the orientation of the polar particle, situated at the location of the orientation of the polar particle, and with some coefficient f. You can think of that as just coming from a relative velocity of the uh, bead medium and the polar particle, but you know, uh, it's an allowed term. So the polar rod moves, follows its nose, and moves at a speed v0, and it disturbs the medium. The next part of the story is that the orientation also has a dynamics. Now, if you have an orientable object in uh, a fluid, then the fluid carries it, uh, rotates it, and aligns it. Shriram, Here you have yes. yes. He's asking, is it force or force dipole? Uh, who asked this question first? Uh, Eric Dufresne. Yeah, it's a force because this whole system is sitting. I mean, the answer to the question is independent of who asked it. I just wanted to know. It's sitting on a solid substrate. And so I am absolutely entitled to introduce a force monopole because momentum balance is the, you know, I can balance my books because I've got a substrate, which is a momentum sink. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the orientational dynamics of this single rod is that it can couple in a polar manner to curvatures of the uh, of the crystal of the crystal planes, in this case the crystal lines, let's say to these two terms, or it can couple to the strain, right? So if you strain a medium, you can imagine it will produce a region in which the rod has a preferential orientation up to sine. If you bend or splay the crystal planes, if you like, you want to think of it that way, then you produce a vector, the local force density or the local curvature, which can align the rods. This guy comes in at some leading order in radians. This guy is at leading order. This guy uh, will turn out not to matter, although we don't really understand why it doesn't play more of a role. Epsilon, epsilon care is the strain. Okay, and so you can then ask, what's the dynamics? So what I'll do is I'll make my life really simple. I'll co-move with the particle. And I'll pretend there's no other particles right now. So then my du over d, del u over del t in the co-moving frame just becomes v0 dot uh, times d over dx. I'll assume, I'll say the particle is moving in the x direction. So I get this and I get this. So now you can see that unlike in a fluid without inertia, when you put in a force, even if you put in a motile particle, um, the uh, leading far field behavior is uh, uh, something sort of, in, you know, let me put it this way. Yeah, unlike in a motile particle moving through a fluid, the rate of change term, here is the rate of change with displacement, comes in at this order. Whereas if you had a motile particle moving through a fluid, the rate of change term would be an inertial effect. The rate of change with displacement term is a damping. And it's there. And it took, so what that means is this active particle is a force monopole, but the displacement field you get is not the Green's function of the elastic medium. It's modified by the fact that the particle is moving in a very serious way. Dimensionally, you can see that this term, and comparing these two terms, you have a length scale, right? And what you get is a displacement field, which, which you know, if you have a copy of Darstein and Rishik in your room, you can actually calculate. Uh, and uh, it looks like this. Alpha and beta are non-dimensional uh, inverse correlation lengths built from the uh, two Lamé moduli. Uh, I've just forgotten to write down beta. It involves lambda plus mu or something. Okay. And similarly for the y component of the displacement field. It's not evident from this form, but it is evident to those of you who remember your uh, mathematics course that the decay of this object for right along the x-axis, for positive x and negative x is very different. In front of the particle, the displacement field is strongly screened, it's exponentially screened, as even minus alpha x in fact. Behind the particle, it's not screened. It decays only as x to the minus a half. So this is really cool. You've got this particle moving along. It leaves a kind of overdamped elastic wake behind it. 
which party was behind it can sense, but it pretty much is like a stealth party as far as what happens in front of it is concerned. And that's one part. So now you can put in, you can look at the effects now. Uh, now imagine you have two particles. What I'll say is in a very simple-minded picture, predictably, this particle will feel the strain field of that particle, that particle will feel the strain field of this particle. They'll reorient either because of the strain mechanism or because of the curvature mechanism. And uh, you can, there's a little, you have to do a little bit of squinting at this to really see that you can imagine that it aligns, if it aligns all along the principal axis of the, of the extensional axis of the strain, then you will see that if I've got one particle and the other particle aligns like this, I'll end up getting a fraction. So we, for the time being, we'll ignore the other variable, the, uh, the other term. Uh, and so we've made some predictions. We've made a prediction of the strain of the form of the displacement field. We've predicted what these two particles will do to each other. If you take the alignment along the extensional axis into account, two particles will approach each other, try to catch each other. Okay, so this is tested in uh, Ajay's lab uh, in this vibrating system. You shake stuff up and down. This is the sample cell. These are big particles, uh, half a centimeter length, about a millimeter in diameter, and there's beads which are about a millimeter in diameter. The rods are brass, the beads are aluminum. Uh, the rods shove the beads around. In this case, they just strain the lattice. And these guys kind of walk. What's happening really is you're tossing it up and down. And uh, when they come down, because one end is different from another, they end up walking in one direction. A sphere doesn't walk because you can't tilt a sphere. At least you won't notice it. And uh, you can recreate this in a simulation that Hush, uh, Sony, and then uh, Rahul Gupta have been doing and wrote and did. Um, you can build the polar particle. You can really slavishly model every detail of the experiment because you want to keep track of which microscopic feature is responsible for what behavior. And uh, you have a nice computer lab that reproduces the experiments. Uh, you can measure the strain fields. Measuring the strain fields is not as trivial as it sounds. You don't really want to measure the particle displacements. You want to back, you want to have a reference density wave without the polar particle in there and compare it to the density wave you get with the polar particle, assume they match far away and figure out the displacement field in the density wave picture. It took us a little time to wrap our heads around that. And when you do that, uh, you can measure the displacement fields. Theory predicts this strongly for off asymmetric displacement field. An experiment, in this case, I guess is simulation, actually sees it. This is the X component, this is the Y component as a function of X. And so these general features are seen very nicely. Uh, we don't do at all well in reproducing the magnitudes of the Y component. Uh, and the reason seems to have to do with the fact that we've put in these fat particles and we haven't taken that into account in the theory at all. There's a large Y displacement which is not taken into account. Nonetheless, um, you can actually, oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I don't, the fits are there in the supplement to the uh, paper I've got in Google today. Um, you can fit and uh, do a reasonable job actually of fitting these forms. You can then look at what happens to particles at low area fractions where the medium is fluid, the particles actually slightly repel, and that's because, or when you have one particle moving along like this, it sets up a flow field like that. You put another one, it turns and goes away. You see that quite nicely in the experiments and the simulations. If you increase the area fraction, the particles attract. Uh, I'll show you movies in a few seconds. I think I'll put them somewhere. I don't know where. You see that quite nicely in the simulations as well. Uh, there is noise in the experiments, and so what you have is an enhanced probability of attraction and capture as you increase the area attraction of these. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you look at the experiments, for example, here are two rods, and you see they seek each other out and uh, pair up, and they stay paired. The experiment, the range over which you can do this experiment is the particles are big H, the experimental sample cell is about that big, so you don't have that much distance to work with. Um, if you look at this, no, this, if you look at low concentrations, you can see this is a simulation. They don't uh, catch each other. If you now 
look is the theory predicts another feature. If you go back to the equations of motion, you will see that the way these particles talk to each other is kind of indirect, right? A given particle reorients the, another particle, and that results in the particle moving in a certain direction. It's not that there is a, you know, SLB like elastic strain based interaction or anything like that. You've got two particles, you put them in, this guy reorients this guy, and as a result, they get, they, they meet up. So Sri Ram, I have a question, yes. question from Meredith. So she is yeah. asking, I may have missed this. What is making the elongated particles move? So uh, if you, uh, sorry, where is it gone? Uh, yeah, in this experiment, uh, I, I kind of tried to indicate it here. So here you shake these guys up and the surface up and down. That's what's done in this experiment. It's shaken at a couple of hundred hertz and about 0.2 mm uh, amplitude. And that's the energy input. That's the nutrient path. You've got this particle. You toss it up. Imagine that the two ends of the particle are somehow mechanically different. One is fat, one is skinny. One is more friction, one is less friction. So what happens when you toss it up and it comes down? Uh, actually, I can say it the following way. You may remember from high school or uh, undergraduate physics that if you take a rod and place it vertically on a frictionless surface and you tilt it slightly and it falls, then its center of mass doesn't move, right? Because there's no friction. If there is static friction, if you toss the rod up and it comes down, it will fall and its central mass will displace. So that ultimately is the walking mechanism. Is that enough? Per perfect. Yes, I did miss it. So it's the it's the asymmetric it's the asymmetric shape. Asymmetry, the, yeah, asymmetry and the, static the, sh the, the shaking and the friction. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I seem to have dropped fast. Um, yeah, I was going to explain about non-reciprocality. So because the interaction is non-mutual and because there is this weird stealth character of the interaction, if you've got two particles like this, as this particle moves along, this guy kind of doesn't know this one is coming because it's this placement field in front is very screen. On the other hand, remember they're both moving. This guy's moving, this guy's moving. As this guy comes along, the guy at the back can sense the elastic wake of the guy in front. The guy in front doesn't know about the guy at the back, or doesn't know much because of exponential speed. As a result, you expect a rather interesting kind of capture dynamics. The theory, if you take the Langevin equation for two particles in such a medium and just solve them numerically. So now we're not doing a numerical simulation of the particle mechanics. We're taking our equations of motion from the theory and solving them, you find this kind of characteristic catch up and uh, join up in this way. You see the same thing in the simulation, you see the same thing in the experiment. Essentially, what happens in the experiment, for instance, is like this. And uh, sure, indeed, the same thing happens uh, in the uh, uh, simulation. You know, it's, it's not significantly more dramatic. I should mention really that almost the first thing that Rahul Gupta pointed out when he started doing these studies, look, they always catch each other by sneaking up from behind. And it took me certainly ages to realize that that was the significant uh, observation. Um, and. Um, so that's what happens. I think I have, yeah, I think I said from the end that maybe I talked too fast. So we've convinced you that uh, elastic interactions of active pol polar particles are really a new, have really a new dimension in the motile particle uh, story. They're naturally non reciprocal You see them in this very simple recreation of motility using this vibrating surface. There's clear evidence, you know, the calculated displacement field the theory seems to agree very nicely with what's seen in the experiments. The uh, seems to predict what's seen in the experiments, and in the simulations at least, uh, you've seen clear evidence for non-reciprocal capture. Um, just for fun, let's show you what happens when you have many particles. So when you have a really large number of particles, you get rather dramatic combinations of flocking and uh, segregation of this sort which we are trying to understand now. That's 
the last part of uh, Rahul's thesis, um, but it's rather pretty. Um, it just strikes me that if you have motile objects, more living motile objects moving through a layer of tissue or you know, fighting their way through the extracellular uh, matrix, uh, elastic interactions of the type that I have talked about, not entirely due to their motility, uh, surely should arise somewhere. I have no idea if they really do, and I know in biology you're not supposed to talk about anything for which there isn't yet evidence. I have no idea if there is, but uh, this is my speculation. And with that, I end my talk. I'll be happy to take more questions. Thank you, Shriram, for a wonderful talk. There are already a lot of questions. So we are going to ask a subset of these questions in this Q&A in the next five minutes, and then we will have a more detailed 15-minute uh, discussion based on both of your talks. So I will start with a question by Navish Vadva and David Lubensky and others had a very similar question. So Navish's question is, what assumptions go in this formulation when it comes to the relative size of the crystal particles and the motile object? So uh, we haven't put in excluded volume uh, between the particle, you know, the, of the motile particle and uh, the medium. You know, if you just take a size mismatch object and stuff it into a crystal, you produce strains which could also give rise to uh, clumping. That kind of thing has not gone in. So that's one important thing that's not gone in. Um, no other direct interactions between the motile particles, no pair potentials. Um, what else have we left out? Also, I should point out that there is the theory and there is the level of accuracy at which we solve the theory. Actually, two particles moving through a medium, uh, you need to solve the whole thing dynamically. Uh, we are working in a regime. This is important, actually. Uh, this gives me the opportunity for a small aside, which if you don't mind, I'll mention. You can imagine that you've got particles um, moving through a medium on time scales in which the medium is, like, is totally relaxed. Okay. Uh, the, so let me just go back to the equations of motion and point out something. Um, yeah, I guess this will work on the other. So this quantity f, if you just look at uh, units here, you will find that this object suitably scaled is a kind of length. And the question, therefore, is whether the screening length is big or small compared to the length. You know, think about the following. Supposing you had, instead of this active matter problem, suppose you had a crystal with a dislocation in it. Okay? Then the Burgers vector comes in as a measure of the uh, jump in the displacement field when you uh, go around. And that's a length. Dimensionally, this term comes in in much the same place as uh, a dislocation uh, density would come in. So F defines the kind of length. Uh, the question is whether, <coughs> excuse me, um, have I done this correctly? Um, yes, I have. Yeah, so there's a question on whether a non-dimensional measure of self-propulsion, that is, V naught moving along, you can compare V0 d over dx to mu del squared in some suitable way at the length scale corresponding to f. And if that Peclé number is small, then the kinds of effects I'm talking about are not that important. And if the Peclé number is big, then the you know, motility aspect is important. That's just one thing that your question prompted for me. It may not be exactly what you were asking. But to go back to what you said, if you look at these equations, you can see that interactions among the, the bead particles are only at the level of their elasticity. Interactions between the rods and the beads are only through forcing and reorientation. Uh, excluded volume in particular is missing. There's something more important, which is that we're also forgetting about the fact that we've got a polar vector in a crystalline medium. I shouldn't really be writing down isotropic homogeneous elasticity. Just like when a dislocation moves through a crystal, it senses the actual spatial modulation of the structure. A polar particle moving through the medium has preferred directions in the crystal. Okay? That has also not been included. You see that in the experiments in the simulation. They like to move sort of between two rows or something like that. So 
yeah, I hope that is, I answered the question I wanted to answer. I hope it is related to what you asked. So I, Shriyam, I think I'm going to ask David Lewinsky's question, which yeah. is related to this. So he's saying this description looks like it rigorously requires a separation of scales between the moving particle and the crystal particles. Then have you thought about whether it is applicable to a crystal made of particles that are themselves motile so that each motile crystal particle sees something like an effective elastic medium created by the other motile crystal particles? So actually there's two things. One is uh, that uh, the complete dynamics, even if the crystal, you know, be, the particles of the crystal aren't themselves motile, um, even that dynamics actually has competing time scales. And we've sort of, you know, done that at a very simple level where we've not worried about, you know, we've not, we, it's like when you do um, uh, hydrodynamic interaction between particles, you do, you don't, you do multiple reflections. We've sort of taken as simple a picture of, as possible, each particle reorienting in the field produced by the other. That, even that dynamics has to be done uh, more carefully and when there are many particles, that's very complicated. I'm not sure how to do it theoretically. In addition, if the crystal particles are motile, uh, you can imagine redoing this. There is already a fairly reasonable description of uh, motile monolayer, crystalline monolayers. Uh, uh, people have done this kind of thing in a phase free crystal language. We have done it uh, with Ananyo and Elastic Theory, uh, active version of Elastic Theory language, and got the rotation invariances right and so forth. So uh, I think that kind of thing can be done here. We've not done it for this particular system. 